we welcome you to our discussion of the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today we're continuing our discussion of the Book of Mormon. I'm Terry Ball from the Department of Ancient Scripture at BYU, and joining me today are three of my esteemed colleagues also from the Department of Ancient Scripture. To my left we have Brother Clyde Williams. Good to have you with us, Professor Williams. Good. Seated next to, to Clyde is Professor Gay Strathern. Thank you for coming, Gay. And also joining us today is our, one of our senior professors and mentor to most of our faculty, Professor Paul Hawkinson. Always a pleasure to be with you, Paul. That's kind of you. Well, we get to discuss the opening chapters of the Book of Mormon itself today, 1 Nephi. But maybe before we look at the chapters, let's take a moment to review quickly. Um, I guess you could call it an abstract that begins the entire, the entire uh, book of 1 Nephi. It's written in italics on the top of my page. Here we are introduced to Lehi and his, his wife, Sariah, and told about the children that, uh, that they had. And then we get a synopsis of what we're going to find throughout the rest of the text, right? How the family, uh, how Lehi receives a vision, the family is forced to flee Jerusalem, travels through the wilderness, reaches the land of Bountiful, and comes to the New World. And then at the very end of it, uh, we see this sentence, This is according to the account of Nephi, or in other words, I, Nephi, wrote this record. So apparently this abstract was actually written on the plates as Joseph uh, translated it. I've always wondered if he wrote this um, at the very beginning, before he wrote 1 Nephi, or if he wrote it at the end, after he had looked through it all and thought, well, I probably ought to give an abstract for this. Maybe he was submitting it for publication and needed an abstract, <laughs> something of that sort. But then Nephi introduces it to, to himself in uh, verse 1. Okay, why don't you tell us a little bit about verse 1 and what we learn about uh, Nephi to get us started today? Well, verse 1 verse through verse 3 is kind of setting up the... It's Nephi's introduction of what his qualifications are for writing this, this, this work. So that he has been born of goodly parents, he has been taught in the learning of his father, he has seen many afflictions, but he's also been highly favoured of the Lord and has experience with a great knowledge of the goodness and mysteries of God. You know, it's, it's interesting, when students look at this first passage, often they have the notion that Nephi's writing this as a young man as they're leaving Jerusalem. And, of course, from 2 Nephi 5, verses uh, 30 and uh, 31, we learn that he's writing this after they've gotten to the Promised Land, so 30-some years after they've left. And this verse, when you read it, clearly is not the writing of someone who's just a young, perhaps a teenager uh, or whatever age he was, but it's a, a, an experienced middle-aged man who's reflecting with great wisdom. And it, it reflects clearly of that wisdom when you look at the, the things he speaks up here and even how he speaks about his parents. And seen many afflictions. By the time he's writing this, he really yes, has seen. Absolutely. He may have felt afflicted as a teenager, but he right. really was the time he actually gets around to writing and this. And yet feeling he was highly favored as well, which is a teenager wouldn't think that I'm highly favored having seen many afflictions. Clearly, he's been able to see how the Lord works with him and delivers him, even though he's had to go through these afflictions. That's so those afflictions have made him what he, what he was almost. Yeah, you get that yeah. feeling, don't you? He then talks a little bit about the language in which he's making the record. Uh, Paul, you're our, you're our linguist. Tell us what we know about the language. Well, the language in, uh, in Lehi's day would have been, of course, uh, uh, Hebrew. Some people call it Old Hebrew. Uh, and there is some evidence that uh, there was a scribal school that uh, um, put out some norms about uh, how to write the language, how to speak the language, and in, so on in and Jerusalem, so forth, the uh, throughout the Judean kingdom, okay. uh, at least from the ninth century on, down through the, uh, the uh, Babylonian exile. And parallel with that, we also know that they're using, uh, in the Judean kingdom, uh, Egyptian numerals at the very least and probably other Egyptian materials too. So uh, it's very interesting that uh, Nephi uh, makes this statement about the, uh, the language of the Jews, uh, the, the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. That's precisely what we find in the record from those days. So it wasn't an innovation unique to the, to the Book of Mormon. Now, oh, now, no. Now later though, we read in uh, Mormon chapter 9 that if their plates had been larger, they would have written in in Hebrew, yeah. but they decide to write in this Egyptian because apparently it's more compact. I've always found compact. I found that an interesting comment because you know Hebrew is a pretty concise language. It is. Egyptian must have been really, really a compact way to write. Yes, yeah. I suppose it's fair to say that in the Book of Mormon we, we really find, in the English version, we find three kinds of language. We find uh, 1820, 1830 English that Joseph Smith would have spoken, and then we find King James English that he uses particularly when he identifies his uh, passages and teachings that are common to the, to the scriptures that he was raised on. And then we also find elements, um, relics, artifacts, I don't know what you'd call it, of, of, 
uh, ancient Near Eastern languages, sentence structures, grammar, language that clearly would have been foreign to Joseph Smith that are found throughout the text. And it came to pass as a big one here that we find coming through all of the time in the Book of Mormon is actually um, a Hebrew um, way of introducing a sentence where they don't have the things that we expect, like a period to say end of sentence and beginning of a new one. That vahaya is a a sign to the reader that we're starting off on a new thought. So what can be repetitious for us can actually is, is an indication of an a ancient Hebrew language. And, and it's not uh, five words like it is in English, and it came to pass. In Hebrew, it's four letters that express that same thing. And so it would have been very easy to just stick that in, and it came to pass, four letters, and that's it. And, and in addition to that, there are other, as you indicate, um, things in the text that uh, to me indicate that this is a translation of, of an ancient text. There are phrases and, and, and the way of uh, putting things that uh, are not really English. So uh, this is a, a translation of an ancient document. There's no question of that. I think the scholarly term we often hear used for these relics of, of, of ancient Near Eastern language is Hebraisms. And perhaps as we go through the text, if you see one that's intriguing to point out, we could point some of those out and share some of them as, as we go along. After talking about the language here in verse, uh, in verse 4, we now move, well, in verse 4 we move into where he's talking, kind of giving us a historical setting. Yeah, this is, this is where he, be, he picks up the record of his father that he's, that he's abridging uh, there in verse 4, because verses 1, 2, and 3 are just the, his introduction to his father's record. And now we pick up the historical record in verse 4 uh, from his father. And this, the abridgment of his father will go up through about chapter 8, right? Right, right. yes. And then, he, then he's writing his own... And then own he begins his own ideas. history uh, uh, writing in chapter 8 again. So what was happening in the world that, uh, when this record begins? So chapter 4 tells us that we're in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah. Now historically we know that this was a kind of a turbulent time, both in terms of Jerusalem and in the region. Uh, we see the decline of the Assyrian Empire that had caused such havoc amongst the, the northern Israelites. But in the process of them being declining, Egypt is always kind of a force that's trying to reassert itself, although it's lost a lot of its power as well. But we're also seeing the rise of the Babylonian Empire. And so just prior to this time, we're having the Assyrians and the Egypts are going to meet at a battle at Carchemish um, in about 605. And from that time on, Assyria ceases to be uh, a world power and Babylon really is in control. And they also, we find them being in control in Jerusalem. And this is going to cause some of the havoc. Um, although the southern kingdom had um, was able to miss some of the trials of the northern kingdom, we see Josiah is there as the king and he starts trying to start some religious reforms, but he's killed. Um, and so in a period from, um, say, from about 605 to 597, we have five kings that are taking, um, leading in Jerusalem. Only the last of these is Zedekiah, and he's actually a son of, of Josiah. But Babylon is going to have an increasing uh, influence in Jerusalem. Um, we're going to see some deportations. This is when, we, when Daniel and Ezekiel are going to go off to Babylon. But it's also a time when the Lord is saying, these things are happening because you guys aren't remembering your covenant. So he's going to send lots of prophets. We're going to have Jeremiah, Obadiah, Habakkuk, and Lehi. He's, so he's just one of the many prophets that is prophesying in Jerusalem at this time. It makes a statement there were many prophets. That's a good list you gave. It's, it's possible that they even may have known Ezekiel or Daniel before they, they were carried away. And the first deportation, at the time this is being written, it's fair to say that Judah already is a vassal state in the Babylonian Empire, right? Yes. Zedekiah was handpicked and put on the throne because apparently he pledged to be a loyal vassal, a, a promise he didn't keep for very long. Less than 10 years, he, he, he remained a loyal vassal of, of uh, the Babylonians. Yes, but there was a strong Egyptian influence still among the, the, in the Jewish kingdom, and eventually Zedekiah caved in and went with that influence and, and eventually rebelled. But in the opening part of this Book of Mormon here, where it's in the first year, where Lehi gets his vision in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, uh, Zedekiah has just been put on the throne in the place of, uh, of his nephew, who had been taken to Babylon captive and was alive because the line of Christ has to come through uh, his nephew. Uh, and it's also in this uh, first year of the reign of Zedekiah that they leave Jerusalem, as we, as we read in the introduction to a third Nephi. So it, it, within a year period, he receives the vision and they leave Jerusalem uh, uh, and get out of there. I think what's remarkable to me is that 
we learn how Lehi becomes a prophet because he's listening to prophets. It's, that's the catalyst. You listen to a prophet, and that leads him, verse 5, to then go and pray about what he's heard. And, and, and he clearly believes, and the Spirit not only bore witness, but he has a vision. And that's what leads him to begin to inquire and then to see these other things that we speak of here. And, uh, you know, following the pattern where he has the vision, he sees God in Christ. In another vision, he receives a book or sees a book which he reads and is filled with the Spirit and the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and then verse 15, where his soul is rejoicing, not because of the destruction, but because he's also shown those who will listen to the prophets as he is listening, don't have to suffer, don't have to uh, be destroyed. And so uh, you, you realize his motivation for going and preaching isn't just, uh, I want these people to be destroyed and I'm going to warn them. It's that I want them to be saved. I'd like them to be able to escape this. And, and that's his motivation, even though it unfortunately is not received as we well know. Every time I look at the way the people responded to Lehi's warning of the impending destruction, I, I wonder why they were so violently inclined to, to try and kill him for it. I mean, if I'm at the supermarket and I see things in the National Enquirer, uh, the fantastic claims and so forth, I just think, well, I just dismiss it as, as kind of a crackpot. I, I have no desire to go out and physically harm the person who makes those claims. But there's something about what Lehi is saying here that really, really disturbs people. Of course, it's a time of, I guess it's, I suppose it's politically dangerous too. I, I think there are two factors here. It's, there's, there's a political and there's a religious side to it. Uh, uh, both Jeremiah and Lehi are warning, don't go against the Babylonians, you'll lose. And that's seen by some people anyway as being um, not patriotic. Uh, you're not supporting the kingdom. You're, you're not being a good citizen of the country. And I think for that reason, there's a lot of people that don't like Lehi and Jeremiah both, as we read in the, in the book of Jeremiah. But also it's because he really is testifying of the Savior and of his redeeming role in the world. And there are apparently some people who don't like that either. Uh, in fact, he's saying a lot more about it than Jeremiah does, uh, which is interesting. You know, as Joseph Smith uh, was translating this, I've often wondered how he must have felt. He probably identified well with Lehi's experience. A glorious vision where he sees the Father and the Son. Um, he's given a message to declare. Uh, eventually he'll get a book, like Lehi gets a book and, and share it. And he experiences the rejection that, uh, that Lehi experienced as well. And, and people that want to harm him for sharing what he had learned. And, he must have, I wonder if he found some comfort in knowing that he was a kindred spirit with Lehi. This also fits in very nicely, though, with, um, with what Amos says, that surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveal his secrets to his servants, the prophets. That word in Hebrew for secrets is sowed, which means the counsels. And, and I see here in this vision that, that Lehi receives is that we have a heavenly council sitting in judgment upon, upon Jerusalem. And I think the book here is saying this is the judgment that's going to come upon them. But God will not enact that judgment until he has given people time to repent. He will always send, send prophets to call them and to, to try and avoid that judgment. And Lehi is caught up in this one of these many prophets, not wanting the people to be destroyed, but wanting to see what can happen if they'll turn back to their covenants, understand what Christ will do them and the deliverance that can come to them. Nephi's also learned, as he states at the end of his writings in 2 Nephi 33, that no man will be angry at these words, save he shall have the spirit of the devil. It's the adversary is playing a part in all of this and stirring these people up to anger against that which is good. And, and he understands that, and, and clearly Lehi, I think, is realizing that as well. And I think also, uh, <clears throat> as we uh, come to the close of, of chapter 1, that, um, as you pointed out, Clyde, uh, Nephi is writing this with hindsight now, uh, already in the New World, and he, the beginning of this record, he wants to make it very clear that even though the vision of his father showed the destruction, and his father also taught about redemption, that the book that he's going to write is being written to show unto you that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even unto the power of deliverance. And now he's going to show us that deliverance and the tender mercies of the Lord through the rest of the book. Yeah, again and again and again we'll see that deliverance, won't we? But the deliverance is twofold, right? It's the physical deliverance here from Jerusalem, but really the most important deliverance is the deliverance that comes from the atoning sacrifice of the Savior. Spiritual deliverance. And that's going to yes. be... We learn about the physical deliverance and as we start into chapter 2. Unlike Jeremiah, Lehi's contemporary, who was thrown in a pit and, and forced to stay there through much of his uh, term as a, as, a, as a prophet, 
the Lord has other plans for Lehi and his family. And, he, and it's interesting, they flee in the, about the only direction which is really safe for them. They don't flee towards Babylon, they don't flee towards Egypt, they don't flee towards the north. They're fleeing to the only area where they can get out of Babylonian and Egyptian and, and, and Jewish influence. They flee south. And do so very secretively, even yes. leaving behind everything that um, they were, that uh, that they had worked for. I suppose you could say the, the list is rather interesting. Here's an example of a Hebraism. I think in verse four, where he, they make a list of the things that um, that they left behind, and it came to pass. This is chapter two, verse four, that he departed the wilderness, and he left his house and the land of his inheritance, and his gold, and his silver, and his precious things, and took this use of the continual use of and and a pronoun his. Uh, an English teacher probably would have. Uh, taking off points off for, for repeating that, but uh, that's not good English, but it's excellent Hebrew. That's how you make the, would, would make the list in Hebrew. Yes, and there's a few other passages in that in chapter 2 there that other people have pointed out in, at the end of verse 6, the river of water, which you would never say in English because all rivers have water in English, but in the Near East, all, not all rivers have water in them. And, and so you say river of water. You want to make sure you know that it's not just a place where water flows sometimes. This is a, a river a place where there's always water. And an altar of stones, you wouldn't say that in English either, you'd say a, a stone altar. But altar of stones is the exact way you would say it in Hebrew. And also going down to the end of verse nine, when Lehi starts speaking in these beautiful poetic sections here, uh, with his sons Laman and Lemuel, at the end of verse nine, oh, that thou mightest be like unto this river continually flowing into the fountain of all righteousness. Well, you really wouldn't say that in English either. Rivers don't flow into fountains in English, they flow out of fountains. But this is Near Eastern poetry. Uh, it's almost a quote for some, from some really ancient material from the ancient Near East. Uh, and and this, is, this is just beautiful stuff to the Hebrew ear. Very good. This use of altar of stones, river of water, uh, plates of brass. It's surprising to me how consistent that form is used throughout the Book of Mormon. It's, it's the construct state, we call it, instead of saying stone altar. In fact, we often say brass plates in the church, but you won't find the phrase brass plates anywhere in the Book of Mormon. It is always plates of, plates of brass, and that's, that's how, you, how you would say it in the Hebrew. Very good. There's uh, another issue that sometimes gets uh, people a little bit confused, and that is how far were they outside of Jerusalem? You could read this, and if you read it too quickly, you think they're three days. Well, anyone would realize if they've studied the area, you're not going to get uh, from Jerusalem down to the borders of the Red Sea in three days. Even with uh, the fastest camels on roller skates, you're not going to make that. However, uh, if we read carefully, we see in verse 5 that they traveled down near the borders of the Red Sea, and then we could add, then they traveled in the borders there for three days. So they're probably a good uh, 10 to 14 days at least outside of Jerusalem. And, and we know from previous occurrences in the, in the Old Testament that this was necessary, not just to, to make life tough, but to put them in a, in a safe zone and away so that when they do return and they're going to put themselves under the precarious situations they do, that uh, the Lord isn't going to have to uh, take other people's lives, many of the lives, to preserve them. I think there's wisdom in what he's done here, and, and I think it's just helpful to recognize that this is the case and why. And I think it's also important to know that, that it is far enough away from Jerusalem that, <clears throat> that they fulfill the law of Moses in being able to build an altar not in Jerusalem. That is, the law of Moses allows you to do that when you're a certain distance outside of the territory. And throughout the Book of Mormon, we will see that they are consciously trying to live the law of Moses. And Lehi, uh, as we know, had the Melchizedek priesthood and could do those, those uh, law of ordinance, uh, those law of Moses ordinances. So it wasn't appropriate for him then to be offering a sacrifice, as we see in verse 7, because he held the Melchizedek priesthood. And they're far enough outside of Jerusalem that he's allowed to do it on his own. Even going the short route, it's about 180 miles from Jerusalem to, uh, to Eilat, the first contact they could have made with, with the Red Sea. Uh, that's a long trip. That's a long trip. Uh, he, some even respect, even I going on. Understand why Laman and Lemuel were murmuring. Yeah. It's yeah. a hard trip, not just yeah. long. It's hard. So they, they likely are about two weeks outside of Jerusalem when they camp um, here by the by the uh, the river of uh, Lemuel and in the valley of Laman. A long, hard trip. I wonder if they thought, well, we've arrived. This is where we're going to stay. Um, but I'm sure Laman or Lehi rather understood this was this was a temporary a temporary stop. It's interesting when you contrast these these two uh, kind of factions that develop in the family here as well. When you ask yourself why are Laman and Lemuel responding the way they do, 
and and Nephi the way he does. And you look at verse 12, and, and really I see there at least two things besides their murmuring. They didn't understand the dealings of God. So many in the world today, it's the same thing. They don't understand the nature and the dealings of God. And so when things happen that they can't explain, they question there is a God. And they surely question what Lehi is doing. And they don't believe that the city of Jerusalem could be destroyed. And this will lead them, unfortunately, to a life of no faith and unbelief. And even though later, as uh, we will see, Nephi will ask them if they would just inquire, but they, they really won't ever do so, contrasted with what he will do. I think this is this passage, one of the things that's very important to me here is I look and see what can I learn about Nephi. Now we know that he is going to turn into and become one of the great prophets ever. But he wasn't always that that prophet. He was a young kid, um, even though he's writing this later. Well, at, at the time he, this is happening, he yes. probably has no idea yes, absolutely. Yeah, what he's going to become. And so when we have this, I think it's set up very nicely that we have Laman and Lemuel. We see that, that them leaving Jerusalem is just really hard for them, and they have no idea why this happened. They can't understand why their dad would do this for them. And then in contrast to that, we have in verse 16, and I love this verse for what it teaches me a little bit about Nephi. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, being accepted, exceedingly young, nevertheless being large in stature, and also having great desires to know the mysteries of God. I wonder if I put myself in Nephi's plate, what would be the greatest mystery for me at this point? And I think like Laman and Lemuel, even for Nephi, it's why is dad doing this? Why are we out here? Um, but but he, he was going to react to that differently to Laman and Lemuel, because he says, therefore I did cry unto the Lord. Laman and Lemuel are going to murmur, but, but Nephi, very early on, we see his spiritual bent that he's willing to cry to the Lord. And behold, the Lord did visit him and did soften his heart. And I did believe all of the words which were spoken by my father, wherefore I did not rebel against him like my brothers. That suggests to me that he had some little angst about this as well. But because he turned to the Lord and the Lord was able to soften his heart, that made all of the difference. It was that one little um, watershed event in Nephi's life that changes him just this little bit, but sends him off on a very, very different road to that of his brothers. Any great challenge can be responded to that way. You can you can murmur or you can inquire of the Lord. And it's going to set up what happens then in chapter 3 with the famous quote of them going back to get the plates, that, that softening of his heart because he seeks the Lord. Uh, it's going to be very important now from our, throughout the rest of the book. Okay. It's kind of an interesting dilemma at the end of verse 12 where it mentions this, where we see Laman and Lemuel murmuring. It says, and they did murmur because they knew not the dealings of God. Well, the reasons they didn't know the dealings of God, the dealings of God is because they were murmuring. Yeah. So you don't know God because you murmur, and you murmur because you don't know God. Somewhere the cycle has to be broken, and it could have been broken if they had followed Nephi's example. I, I, just a, a little bit about Laman and Lemuel. Some people think that these were really stupid brutes who didn't know anything at all. Uh, I don't think so. I think they were as learned as, as uh, Nephi was in the language and the history and so forth. They knew that Jerusalem had, had problems in 721 with the Assyrians, in 701 with the Assyrians. In fact, in 701, when the Assyrians tried to capture Jerusalem, Isaiah said it would not be captured. I think Laman and Lemuel knew their Isaiah and knew the prophecies about Jerusalem. And then again in 601, when Nebuchadnezzar comes through, uh, 604, when Nebuchadnezzar comes through the first time, he doesn't bother Jerusalem. And in 597, when Zedekiah is put on the throne, the city also is not captured. So they know their history. They know that Jerusalem has never been captured. Isaiah said it wouldn't be captured. And they think that the people in Jerusalem are righteous. So you think they supposed that Isaiah's promise to, in 701, carried clear over into, into 600 B.C., that they Jerusalem would the not be... They were covenant people, and God would be with them. That God would protect Jerusalem for his namesake, it, uh, Isaiah says. And, and uh, I don't doubt that Laman and Lemuel knew their scriptures on that point. They just, the problem was, they didn't believe the living prophet. They were, they, they were exactly. going after, the, they were believing the dead prophet and not the living one. Because the living prophet was saying... Jerusalem's going to fall, especially if you ally yourself with the, with the Egyptians um, rather than fearing the Babylonians. Well, this is a family story, too, and we see in, in all families, or at least the potential, where you've got your Laman and Lemuel or Laman and Lemuelette types, and you've got your Sams who are good followers and your Nephi's, and, and, and you can see where it leads to. When you're, when you're one who rebels or murmurs and who doesn't ask, that'll be the same in any family setting, whether you're traveling in the wilderness or you're in downtown Salt Lake City. It, it, it just is, uh, I think there's a lot of application for us, too, to see that this can be 
uh, both a warning and counsel if we apply it in our own circumstances of how we fit in our families. So Gay, you've just finished teaching these first two chapters to your students in your Book of Mormon class. What difference do you hope this makes in their life? Well, it seems to me that there are two things that uh, Nephi is trying to get that set up the rest of the Book of Mormon. In chapter one, we've had that the tender mercies of God will be upon us and we will be delivered physically and spiritually, with an emphasis, I think, on the spiritually. In chapter two, I think the, the, the really important lesson here for us is that Nephi is told once he has softened his heart and has turned to the Lord, twice the Lord is going to, to say to him that if you will keep my commandments, you will prosper. So that's in verse 20. And then lest somebody's falling asleep, let's repeat it again in verse 22. And inasmuch as thou shalt keep my commandments, you'll be the king. For me, those are the two big lessons in these chapters that set up the rest of the Book of Mormon. Tender mercies of God will be delivered, but you have to keep the commandments of God um, for the Lord to be able to bless you in your lives. Whether we're Nephi or whether we're living in, in our day and age, those principles are just as strong and as powerful for us today. Well said. Thank you so much.